So let's talk about uh, some OWASP tools to begin with. Hope you don't mind if I uh, sit while we talk. Um, the, uh, my notes are too far away for me to read when I'm standing, I'm afraid. So um, what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit first about some of the OWASP tools. They produce a great number of open source tools that are available for you to download and use. Uh, we'll talk about some of those tools today. Uh, we'll also introduce another tool. I don't know how many people here have seen Burp Suite. Excellent. Zap. Zap is one of the biggest uh, series of downloads from OWASP, in fact. Uh, Zap is a similar to Burp Suite in that it's a completely free tool. We'll be using it today for the demo. So we're going to talk a little bit first about the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, that's the important issue first. Let's isolate what we want to do, and then we'll talk more about what the uh, actual process, process we're going to be using is to generate the information. So from here, uh, you can see a picture of me standing next to a huge, that bear was monstrous. Um, but at the same time, I work for CodeDX. CodeDX is a uh, application security uh, business. We were spun out from another company called Secure Decisions, but that's as much company history as I'm sure anyone's interested in. We author uh, two of the uh, open source tools. We have something called the, uh, the uh, Attack Surface Detector, the ASD, and we also have another tool uh, that is generated for uh, looking at the data coming from the ASD to help you populate Zap. And we have another tool, Code Pulse, to help you review the dynamic analysis of what you're looking at uh, inside of your, your code. And this would be while you're doing your testing. Uh, it's a visualization tool, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So here's the to topics for today's discussion. Uh, we're going to first start with an overview. We're going to understand what an attack surface is and why it's so important to understand what your attack surface is and what you're defending against. Um, without being able to do that, you'll know right away that it's almost impossible to do any kind of adequate defense against uh, anyone trying to hack into your system. We'll talk about some of the advantages these tools give to the white hat hacker. Does the white hat hacker give uh, have enough time? Does he have enough resource? Uh, is his information good? Uh, these are critical pieces of things. These are critical pieces of a puzzle that he can put together to try and make the application much more secure, to make your application uh, better uh, in the in the field. And uh, we'll talk more about the penetration test workflow. We'll follow that with talking directly about the application secure. Uh, app <laughs> Sorry. We'll talk about the attack surface detector, the ASD, what the challenges it meets and how it gives you the information you're looking for. And we're also going to talk about OWASP Code Pulse. Code Pulse is the visualization of dynamic uh, information der derived during your dynamic testing. And we'll wrap up at the end. I'll put links to all of these tools near the end and then my contact information. We are displaying here at OWASP. We're down at booth 10, which will be down there near the coffee, which is a good thing. Not the good coffee, the coffee. That's the, on the other side. I'm on the outside near the beach. So uh, generally speaking, when you do this, you're vulnerable to attack. Uh, there is something that will make your uh, code vulnerable. So you can't possibly be able to make sure that you have all possible avenues of attack covered. So understanding the attack surface is almost as important as understanding what your remediation will be to help fix whatever it is you find. So most of the people who are working in this industry know that it's a monumental task. How do you take information you're getting from development? How do you take it in a timely fashion and get all of that information out to either developers to fix the problems or even detect the problems before things go into the field? So, uh, you might, uh, simply turning on your computer can give you things like an OS uh, problem, where the OS is vulnerable. You may be using libraries in your OS, things completely unrelated to the attack surface that you are defending against, the ones you know about, like in your source code. So that's a discussion for something else. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to refocus our attention. We're going to look back at the uh, a system uh, and review how we can develop an attack surface to understand why that makes a difference. So I'm not a theoretical guy. I like a concrete example. So let's talk concrete. Now, 11 November last year was the 100th anniversary of uh, the, uh, uh, World War I. Uh, this is the end of World War I. 
uh, and we'll look at it from the point of view of it being our tax surface. So generally speaking, how do you defend from perhaps thousands of people motivated to come into your area and take your possessions, take land from you, um, or perhaps just threaten people you love? Uh, these things are, uh, these were some of the issues that were fought during World War I, uh, World War II as well in a much different way. Uh, and the system you see here for just stopping a broad number of people attacking you. What do you do to make that happen? Now remember, this was in a day where you didn't have, you had single shot rifles. High duration machine guns were unavailable. You could get a machine gun, but they had to do all kinds of crazy things to keep the machine gun working. You had problems with logistics, getting ammunition to it to keep them fed. So looking at all of those problems, simply defending from a standing position, people coming across a field at you, would be almost impossible, especially if you're outnumbered. In this case, trenches came to the rescue in World War I. Even though during the, uh, while I was doing some of the research to uh, generate this paper, I found out that the, French's, uh, the French had a characteristic, they were trying to do the mobile attack, the stay on the move, stay on the offensive. Uh, and that kind of led to the German blitzkrieg strategy in the later years. But remember, no reliable gas engines, tanks were in their infan in infancy, single shot weapons. All these things were against that kind of, uh, of offensive action. Looking at the trenches themselves, what could you do to protect yourself? Well, you dig the trenches in, you put an area where you are only showing maybe the top of your head. So the attack exposure you have is only the soldiers above, uh, looking above the trench. And this kept your men semi-safe. So when people attacked your position, you could fire at them while they were coming across a... <laughs> Thank you. The, they were coming across uh, the line after you. Uh, and you could stop them in general. Uh, you know, big masses of attacks, machine guns, barbed wire. There were a lot of things that were developed along with trenches to help people uh, keep you from being um, uh, overrun. Now the trenches themselves were also critical pieces of the infrastructure. You're defending what is behind the trench. You're not defending the trench intrinsically. That's not the value proposition. In this case, the value proposition is whatever was behind you. The trenches themselves, however, were used to make it so the attacker coming at you could be predicted. The zigzag trenches were put in so that if you lost part of a trench, you could use that part because they would have to come down known routes to attack you. Therefore, you could stop them in, def in, uh, in depth by backing up, seed part of the trench, and then you could fire into them. Now, the trenches themselves were also zigzag to keep you from having enfilading fire, people firing into the trench along long lines. Uh, so you see, all of these different problems are being heaped up. Every time you have a solution, zigzag the trench, defense in depth, other things to keep, it, uh, keep your defenses uh, high and not allow the enemy to simply push through and allow you to uh, be uh, uh, successfully attacked. Now, also during this time, uh, we're looking at some of the initial start to combined arms. So you'll have large uh, mortar attacks and then wave of attacks of men. So the mortar attacks were one of the things that were deadly. The trenches once again to the rescue, hunker down in the trench, the spread out your line of people. So all of these things are things you can do to protect yourself uh, from having any kind of infiltration in your trench and also get basically overrun by the kinds of things that you see coming at you. So let's move back. We've talked a little bit about the trench warfare. We've talked about the attack surface of trench warfare and the defenses you can apply to make those mitigate those attacks. But let's take a look at some of the advantages that you would have as an ethical hacker trying to prevent anyone from breaking into your systems. Uh, we know that this is a huge task. Um, anyone who's worked in uh, any kind of uh, a security system know that you're kind of the last man on the boat. Uh, the systems generally will be released. You're given maybe some time if you're really lucky. Uh, you're given plenty of time. You might not be given enough manpower to do all of the checking and searching you need to do. So basically, since the attack can come from anywhere, uh, you don't really know what to uh, defend against first. And that's what some of these tools are going to help you do. It'll allow you to understand what kind of things can attack you 
And once again, you're manning the trenches. You're looking into keeping the enemy coming into routes that you can defend heavily. <clears throat> so how many people here have had plenty of time when uh, the product is about to be reviewed or product released? Who has plenty of time to do their pen testing or plenty of time to do their, yeah. I didn't expect anyone to hold their hands up. Uh, there's never enough time. Uh, two of the things you run into, and, and especially with pen testing, is that you may not know the attack that you need to perform to see what's going on in the software. Or you get lucky, you do have an attack you can perform, and you get through their defenses. Um, so one of the things that you can do to help make your life a little easier is to move away from simply a black box brute force attack. Those are both while they can be effective, you're kind of rolling the dice. There's no, uh, I know that this is going to work, I'm going to use this attack. I know this is going to work, I'm going to use this attack. It's usually, use this attack, did it work? Use this attack, did it work? So looking at it from that point of view, it'll give you a lot of personnel, a lot of time to figure that out. Now, what the white hat has to his advantage is that he does have access to several pieces of information ostensibly your black hat hacker does not have. He has access to the source code, to the developers. He knows exactly what is being done and what libraries are being used to create a, uh, a product and therefore his attacks can be made such that they reflect on the products that are being used, the things that are being done. Uh, and these things can help you figure out what things you need to do as a white hat to figure out what things could be attacked. <clears throat> so let's talk about the typical penetration testing workflow. So from here, uh, we're looking at what the typical pen tester does for his daily life. You'll need to have some kind of a login, generally. It's possible that you may be given a, uh, just a, a wide field, a green field, and say, hey, attack this. Here's the address of the web service we want you to look at, and then you attempt to break into it or work around it. These systems done this way, you can spend a lot of time just brute forcing it to find nearly nothing. Normally what happens is you'll be given uh, an authentication. You'll be told what are the things that could be he can do. So you'd check for things like can he actually log into the system? Is it possible for him to do things that he's not supposed to do? So you have a little bit of a leg up to understand what the application's really doing. Another thing that happens that you can get that's uh, useful for you is an endpoint enumeration. The black hat's not going to have an idea of the endpoints nor the parameters those endpoints demand. Therefore, given that information, you're able to fuzz attack if you wish to, or look at the code in a way that allows you to gather information about your application, and at the same time, uh, push data into it so that you can see whether or not it falls apart. So once you've been able to log in, you have a lot more checks available to you. There's no more brute forcing. Now you have the capability of going in, understanding what's going on, and testing different parts of the system. Here are some of the tools we'll talk about today. We're going to talk about the OWASP Z Attack Proxy. We'll be using that as part of the demo. Uh, the demo itself will include WebGoat running in a Dockerized container, talking to uh, Zap, and we'll use Zap and Chrome to attack the WebGoat. Um, we'll also use the Attack Surface Detector. Now, for WebGoat, we're not going to use the Attack Surface Detector. We're going to use it during another open source uh, a piece of uh, software called uh, Pet Store. J Pet Store is the actual name of it. Um, and if anyone wants to, anyone wants the uh, information, I'm more than happy to give that to you. It's an open source project as well. Uh, both of these are in Java. Uh, that's where we can take and use Code Pulse as an agent inside of Java to look at the J Pet Store, also running in a Docker container, and then look at the results of what our testing looks like. And that's really critical to understand, um, first of all, what can the tools do for you? And then you can apply those <coughs> to your daily life. These are free tools. All of the things I'm going to show you today, you can download from OWASP uh, and uh, the J Pet Store if you want to do testing or playing with it. Uh, that's available also from, uh, it's on GitHub, I believe. I can track it down. Anyone who's interested, please leave me a business card. I'll be more than happy to get that information to you. 
So let's talk about the OWASP surface attack surface detector first. When you look at your attack surface, what are the pieces of information that you need to know to attack it effectively? Number one, what are the endpoints? Number two, what parameters do the endpoints take? And those two pieces of information can give you ideas of what to do to attack, to test the code more thoroughly, and understand what's going on. So the current problem is simply that you don't know all of the endpoints. Suppose there are abandoned endpoints or orphan endpoints where the code is now changed or you're in maintenance or you're simply adding new features. And those new features may uh, make some of the endpoints that you're using useless or unavailable to you. So from there, those may be in the code still, you just may not know to test them. So the attack surface detector is to give you uh, more information about the things that you're actually trying to test. These are some of the things that the attack surface detector will look for. It understands these different pieces, uh, these different uh, strategies for looking at code. It runs on these languages at the top and at the bottom it understands those frameworks. Now the attack surface detector looks at source code. It does not run a binary analysis. Um, it does not look at uh, your code from a, uh, a linked version. We're looking at your source code at this point. And from this source code, you can generate a series of either JSON files or push them directly into Zap. And this gives you a preceding capability without spending engineering time figuring out how to get those endpoints in. So preceding gives us more information about what's going on. Some of the benefits you get right away are that it's automated. Automation is your friend whenever you're doing any kind of work like this. The more of the activity that you can automate, the less you need bodies to perform. Sometimes it does benefit to have someone actually sit and work with the code, but in general, um, brute force attacks aren't that valuable. It takes a lot of people, but now we're looking at it from a different point of view. We're moving to knowing the endpoints, knowing the parameters that the endpoints take, and being able to generate attacks against those endpoints. So to minimize the surface attack, uh, the easiest thing to do um, is to finally look at the, that information, put it into your whatever your dynamic analysis tool is, and then use that to give you a better spider or better attack at the surface of your, uh, your, your uh, application. Now, the manual penetration testing is uh, tiresome. It takes a long time to get that done. Um, so the ZAP is scriptable. It has a full scripting uh, system inside of it. I think it's called uh, Zest, if I'm not incorrect. Um, but we'll take a look at some of the features of that when we do our first series of attacks uh, and look at the, the uh, ZAP's results of looking at the web goat um, with, um, with the attack surface detector information. So these are available today. Um, both of these, everyone's obviously heard of before. The attack surface detector is a plug-in to both of these tools. It's available in the marketplace in both of these tools. Um, I think Zap is the most successful OWASP uh, download. Um, I think it's been downloaded somewhere between eight and 10,000 times. And uh, the attack surface detector isn't very far behind. I think we're three or 4,000, two or 3,000, maybe three or four. Um, I was told that recently. Uh, so these are popular tools to take a look at uh, to help you with your code or fixing problems or finding problems in your code. So this is the uh, attack surface detector. This is the plugin that goes into Zap. We'll see this in just a moment. I put it here so that you could see more of the information on the screen. I apologize it's so small, um, but there's a lot of data here. The attack surface detector can be used in a number of different ways. Um, some, there's a way to take the attack surface detector, point it at them, I'll call it the ASD from now on, point the ASD at your source code tree and it will look through the source code, finding the endpoints and showing you those endpoints inside of the surface detector itself. You can also pre-generate them. We pre-generate in, that information and we can put that information directly into uh, Zap as well as Burp. Here's what it looks like once the results are pulled in. The attack surface, the ASD, will give you the endpoints that it detects, 
It'll tell you what is the method used to attack those endpoints or to reach those endpoints. And these are both critical pieces of information, especially for doing any kind of a web application. The use of a put instead of a get in some cases may not generate any kind of information for you. So in this case, you have all of the information you need from the endpoints that were detected inside of the source code, and that information is given uh, to you as a JSON file or a plugin to precede Zap. Here, if we select one of them, you can see the endpoint and you can see the parameter. In this case, I chose the uh, WebWolf uh, file upload. I know that's really tough to see. Uh, it's all the way over there on the end, if you can see my pointer. Uh, that's that one. And here's the actual operation that would be performed. And this is just information for you. What is being injected? What is being given to Zap for further testing? The check marks tell you that these different parts are in place. And you can see behind you, we can shift up and down and simply click OK. Once you do a preceding, um, Zap has more information. Now it'll have more to spider. So it'll spider more. It'll give you more um, information during the attacks. In this case, you can see that there are 145 URLs found, and this is without using the attack surface detector. We're looking at WebGoat version 8.0.0 M21. Anyone who wants to do this themselves, please. Um, there's a dockerized version of WebGoat you can use. You can download uh, Zap and the, uh, attacks, uh, the ASD this afternoon, if you wish, um, and connect the two together and understand what's going on inside of WebGoat. A little bit bigger um, message of the same thing. Uh, you can see over here, URLs found, 145. Um, I've revamped the demo slightly. The number of URLs that will be found as part of the demo will be about 139. So there are some fewer um, uh, uh, URLs that will be detected. <clears throat> the active scan results resulted in this case in 11,829 results. There were requests made against the attack surface that you have for WebGoat. So WebGoat is a vulnerable web server, okay? But it helps to illuminate a number of different things. Number one, we have 145 URLs and we also have 11,000 uh, operations that will be performed. And this is all can be automated. This has no human intervention required. The ASD, when it puts its information in, I'll show that how that works in just a moment. But when the ASD pushes its information in, you can see that the number of URLs jumps from that low number before, 145 to 179. So now we have a much larger attack surface to look at. And these may be places where parts of WebGoat are not being maintained, or parts of WebGoat are just vulnerable by purpose, and these endpoints exist, but may, you may not have known about them. And you can see the number of requests performed against the much larger space, because now we don't just have the URL itself to attack, we also have the URL, we have the parameter list, so we can do a wide number of attacks against the same, uh, same code. And this is looking at the same code. The only thing we've added has been the uh, ASD. Now I'm gonna shift gears. I know this is kind of jarring to do this. We've only got a few more slides, and then I'll go into the demo and show you how this works. Uh, so here, what we have is Code Pulse. Now, Code Pulse is a completely separate product. It does something much closer to IAST. So, looking at Code Pulse, we're going to take a Java uh, piece of code, we're going to connect an agent to that Java piece of code, and that will be uh, connecting the agent, will connect data back into Code Pulse. Now, Code Pulse also has the benefit of looking at the source. We're going to take the WAR file generated for JPET Store, drop it into Code Pulse. It'll analyze it for us. I'll show you some of the results of that analysis. And from there, uh, we'll be able to gather information for the pen tester to understand how much is being tested, how many things are being tested that weren't tested before, and how are the actual individual testers doing to give you coverage on your source code. So we can detect all of that information inside of Code Pulse, as well as give you a good visualization about what's going on. So we can take a look at how Code Pulse works. I've largely talked about some of it. Uh, this case, um, this animation, I forgot to pull out actually, I'll be honest. Um, but the animation here is where the black box perspective is the usual knowledge that the pen tester has. From there, 
we plug in the Code Pulse agent, and the Code Pulse agent runs. Uh, you can run it on Tomcat. It's fairly simple to do. I can talk about that if anyone's interested. Uh, it uses these two uh, run times. So with these two run times, the Code Pulse agent can be placed into either to generate information that's going to be given back to Code Pulse, and then Code Pulse's information will be given to the white hat hacker. Now, the information you're looking at here is the glass box opportunity that the hacker has. If we look at that information directly, we can see that uh, uh, there's a bunch of information developed for you. Now, what I'm going to do is to show this again when I do the demo. Uh, it'll make a lot more sense at that point. Uh, but just generally speaking, uh, we do a static analysis whenever you're given a WAR file to take a look at the information. That static analysis includes dependency check, so even another uh, OWASP product. Now, when you download and install Code Pulse, you get the attack surface detector, you get dependency check, uh, dependency check is executed for you, the attack surface detector is executed for you, and the information reflected inside of the, the tool itself. Demo time. Uh, what we'll do is I'm going to switch off of PowerPoint and I'm going to move over to using a demo. Um, we're actually going to use a live system. And we'll come back to the PowerPoint at the end, but only for two slides. I don't want to make anyone have a heart attack. So I'm going to start by, we're going to take a look at the, the, um, uh, the attack surface detector used against WebGoat. So we're going to start by generating our container. This has been pre-genned. Anyone who's interested in the recipes, I have them. Uh, so we've started uh, WebGoat in the background so we can now connect to it. Now what we're going to do is open up Zap. By opening up Zap, um, um, if I opened up Zap, it would be a lot better. So I'm going to open Zap. It's not a demo unless you do it wrong at least once. Just so you know. I've been doing demos for years and years and years. If something doesn't flame out, it's not a demo. It, you're just playing. <laughs> so here is our system looking at information from uh, Zap. Right now it doesn't know where anything is. How many people here have used Zap a lot? How many people here have used Zap a little bit? Good. I'm in good company. That's where I am too. <laughs> I'm only holding my hand up to give people an idea they should hold their hands up. But I'm new to Zap and I found a couple of things that are actually really interesting when you use it. So in this case, we're going to take a look at the uh, Chrome. And from Chrome, what we're going to do is reach over to Zap, and we're going to give it our first series of surfaces to attack. So I know that my hub, is my uh, version of WebGoat is located at localhost 7070, and then it's WebGoat for the service. Now you'll notice in the background, as soon as I hit the Zap, uh, once I hit that uh, uh, Chrome to go to WebGoat, you'll notice the ZAttack proxy is listening to all of the operations I'm performing. And by listening to my operations, it can do man-in-the-middle attacks, it can do a variety of other things. So it's really valuable to give Zap a little heads up. What do you need to do? In this case, we also need to give Zap some more information. We'd like to give it a login. So brute forcing against the interface with no login is not going to generate a lot of information. But we can register a user, and I'll just put a user in. Like I said, if it doesn't go wrong, you're not, you're not doing a demo. So this user already exists. That's a good thing. Now what we're going to do is to go back to WebGoat itself off of the register page. And you can see that Chrome took care of logging us in. But I need a clean login so I can set my authorization really easily. So I'm going to log out and log back in using the WebGoat page. OK. We've now given a Zap the information it needs. What are the places in the code where we need to log in? What does the login look like? What we can do is close the Chrome at this point, And we're going to set a context. This context will allow us to evade attacking things we may not have the legal, I said legal, capability to do. 
you attack some websites using the Z attack proxy, it's possible they can come looking for you. Um, so the thing I don't want to do, I don't want to pop Google with a ton of requests. I don't want to hit gstatic with a ton of requests. These are operations performed by Chrome to set your user and perhaps grab information about you. So we're going to isolate our context by going here, left clicking, and then right clicking, and we're going to say include in context. And this is our default context. From our default context, we can then add an authentication. If we go down here where it says authentication, we can say that this, we know that, I happen to know that WebGoat is a form authentication. So I'm going to set the form authentication. And then all you have to do to add information to it is to go out to the form that you need to fill out. And you can see here a post operation that was performed using the password and username. Yeah, it's insecure, but you know, we're, we're using WebGoat here. So if I select that, you can see that we immediately fill the target URL. What does the login page look like? And what do we get back from it? What do we need to send as parameters? In this case, you can see that vhopson and passwords vhopson. And then what I'm going to do is go to the user name here. Even though they're the same, I like to change this simply for consistency. So at this point, we can add additional users if we want to. Or we can simply uh, go from here. Now we're going to do something else to reduce the number of uh, messages we get from Zap. Zap's going to say, I need to have some idea of what is considered to be a successful login. So let's set that up. It's easy to do. Uh, we simply go back to our context. And then from the context, I double clicked it, I'm sorry. Uh, and then, uh, well first, let's get the information. If we go over to the local host again, uh, we're going to go down to the place where we did our post for the password, and we're going to drop that into the, um, uh, the re request editor. So once you've dumped it into the request editor, we can simply make another request to log in. WebGoat's tolerant of that, so we can take care of that right away. The benefit of doing this is we can do a send, and we see the packet coming back. Here are the headers that come back at the top. I'm going to copy that because I happen to know that lets me know that I've logged in successfully. So I've control C that jump out, and then I'm going to go back into my context. I'm going to go back into my authentication, and then down here, the regular expression pattern from the response, I'm going to simply insert the HTTP 1.1200. I'll do the same for the logout. I happen to know it's the same uh, packet. So now Zap knows how to log in. It knows what a login response should look like, and it knows what your logout response should be as well. At this point, we can get rid of all of the different sites that we don't care about. You can see we have four sites here. Let's get rid of some of them. And then what we have left is the one we put in context. The little bar, uh, ball up here turns those extra ones off. If we spider this, I'm going to spider it right from the top. I'm going to say I want to use the default context and the vhops and login, and then start the scan. Notice that's quick. Uh, we generated 139 URLs, and the 139 URLs can now be used as an active attack. I'm not going to do it. It takes a while. It takes four minutes, maybe. Um, this is left as an exercise for the student. If anybody wants to do it, I'll be more than happy to give you a hand with it. Uh, it's pretty simple to set up. So let's add the attack surface detector. How do you do that? We can add the attack surface detector from the marketplace. I've already done so. So adding the attack surface detector shows it up down here. When you see the attack surface detector as a lower tab, these lower tabs can be used to gather information about the project that you're looking at. So you see all of the same information I had before. I've pre-populated it with a JSON file that I used as part of the attack surface detector's detection area. And I'm going to import the endpoints from it. Let me slide this down a little bit. Because what I want to do is to open up all of these. And you can see how big this bar is right now. When I import the endpoints from the CLI JSON, you saw it got bigger. And from there, we see also the endpoints were successfully generated from the JSON file I'm using. Now, the attack surface detector can also take multiple JSON files, and you can do comparisons between the two. What attack surface have you increased? Have you decreased it? And you can keep track of it in that way. From here, 
successfully placed. We can respider it at this point. Notice that the attack surface detector isn't used as part of the dynamic analysis. We can attack this with a spider. We'll put in the V Hopson as the person that we want to run it with, and we'll start the scan. So now instead of 139, we have 174 URLs that we can attack. <coughs> These URLs are detailed inside of the attack surface detector if you're interested in taking a look at them. Uh, they're right here, and they're under the tab uh, it results. Here's what you saw before. This tab allows you to take a look at all of the URLs that were detected, even ones you may already have in your system. If we slide down to the uh, WebWolf file upload, and if you double click it, it will tell you the parameters, and I happen to know that one has parameters. A large majority of the URLs do not. This will tell you not only the parameter, but you can see at the bottom it says the parameter is a string. So now we not only know that this particular endpoint takes a parameter, but it also takes a string that you can fuzz or you can push bad data into and see what kind of result you get back. So what I'm going to do now is shift gears. I'm going to go over to Code Pulse. We'll demo Code Pulse um, and then we'll uh, close up and I'll start looking for questions for anybody who's interested. So I'm going to close this down. And this is easy to bring back up, by the way. So I'm going to close the WebGoat Docker. Now what we're going to do is take a look at Code Pulse. Code Pulse is a slightly different animal. As we said before, this is a visualization of the testing that you're doing while you're doing it. It's, more, uh, it's better related to IAST, as I'm told. I'm afraid I don't know much about IAST. How many people here use IAST or know a lot about it? Yeah, it's, a, it's a new thing, as far as I can tell. Is it? It's not very old, I'm pretty sure. Two, three years old. Yeah, I, so, you know, it's, it's the new way to actually take and get results from your dynamic analyses. So from here, uh, we're going to open, uh, actually I'm going to delete that so that you can see the analysis for JPET store is really simple. I'll simply open a new project inside of Code Pulse. And then what we're going to do is go here and grab the war file. So this has already been compiled. It's got a bunch of information about how the code actually runs. And we're going to open it. And then I'm going to tell Code Pulse to go ahead and take a look at it. So Code Pulse is going to do two things. It's going to look at the code. It's going to generate a inventory for all of the code you have here. It's going to generate a dependency check of all of the libraries that you're using. And from there, we're also going to run the attack surface detector. I'll show those to you inside. Um, you can see the scanning is running on the jars right now. That's dependency check executing. And what we're doing there is we're trying to gather information about potential uh, problems that you could have from your version of the jar that you're using. And dependency check will give you a CVE related to that. Notice that the trace has a check mark here and a check mark here. We don't trace the jars. You can if you wish. We can trace the JARS execution as well. But in this case, I'm not going to. Um, it would simply slow things down for no, no real return. Uh, in this case, too, looking at the code, we probably want to check what we want to look at. Notice when I click that check mark, it pulled open a tree map. I'm going to open this full screen. I'll reduce it in a moment. So it pulls open a tree map. So you can look at the classes themselves as well as any of the methods inside of those classes. It's also built with the bytecode count as the size of each of these blocks. And you can see all of the different things that are contained inside. Now I'm going to click the JSPs. And you can see it put one above the other. Here are the JSPs. And here is the code. Another thing that's been done is that the attack surface detector has been run automatically against this code. This little icon you see here and here are the entry points to this application. I don't know how JPET Store works, but I don't need to. And that's one of the huge benefits of using automated tools to look through the code to give you this information. So once these pieces of information are available to us, we can click the little stacked uh, squares up here. And the stacked squares bring only the attack surface detection components to the top. So you can see exactly what code you're going to go through for all of your requests 
for your system. I've noticed that my dependency check failed. Once again, it's the curse of doing a demo. So what we're gonna do is open these up. Uh, it doesn't seem to like me very well. We'll just look at the JSPs in that case. So I'll take that trace away. I'm gonna reduce this because I need to open the JPET store. This is another Docker running in the background to bring up JPET store. And you'll notice as soon as I started JPET store, the agent connected to Code Pulse. Now what I have done is I put a special command inside of the Tomcat uh, in ENV, the environment for it. And what that did was specify the Java agent that would be run as part of this operation. That Java agent connects to a hard address, which is this, and this is running on the uh, Docker side of the network. So if we go inside of this uh, project in general, we add that data. You can see the little turning wheel. Now we're capturing data from uh, the agent running uh, JPET store. So what I'm going to do is pull that down. I'm going to get rid of that so we can see the code. Actually, you know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to restart it too. I apologize. This goes smoothly until someone's watching. As soon as that quits, I'm going to restart the code pulse. So it's going through and processing it once again to give us a code inventory. And then from there, we will uh, take a look at what's going on in the code. So I'm going to select uh, the class and the JSPs. I'm going to drop this to one side. And then I'm going to bring up uh, our Chrome. And we can see the JSPs, the classes are at the bottom and the JSPs are at the top. Now this once again is our inventory. If we go and talk to JPET Store by going localhost 6060, we see that it is not connected. So I guess if I started, it would be much better. <laughs> now we see the connection. We're going to say put it into this project. And then from here, we're going to take a look at JPET store again. You can see on the left hand side, some of the uh, elements have already populated. So we have a connection. We have JPET store. Now, if I want to see what goes on when I do different parts or different operations, I simply do the operations and we can see the code on the left hand side change as I do so. But what I'm going to do is start a recording. This first recording is going to be Tom. I'm just picking a name at random. And Tom's going to go in and he's not going to sign in. He's simply going to go into the store. Notice the yellow highlighting. He's going to go into fish. He's going to say, I want to buy a koi. I'm going to add it to my cart. And then I'm simply going to abandon. So that was the testing he did. And you can see he covered a fair number of different pieces in the classes. And you can see the pieces he covered up here as part of the JSP. So let's start a new recording. And we're going to call this guy Jim. Now we've started a new recording and we're gonna to stop Tom's recording. So starting the new recording, Jim, will allow us to do something a little different. We're gonna say Jim is going to sign in. You see the yellow on the left-hand side. He's going to submit his credentials. He's gonna buy a dog. And he's gonna say, proceed to checkout. Continue. Some fake information here. And then he's done. So we've gone through the website to simply buy an animal. So that's mainly what this is about. But you can see that the coverage on the left-hand side is much different between Jim and Tom. If I go back over to here and close this recording, I can now take a look at the differences between what Jim did and what Tom did. We see here Jim as the turquoise, 
My wife says I'm colorblind, so if it's something different up there, say something. Uh, and we can look at Tom in green. Now, if you want to see the difference between the two of them, we can simply highlight them both. The black areas are the places where they overlapped. The other places you can see down here, by simply hovering over it, that this activity was traced and it was assigned to Tom. It's in the Tom trace. The teal portions here are in the Jim trace, and that's from the box over there to the left. I'm going to open this up so you can see more of the information here. So we can see exactly what was executed. We can see who, what stream was executed, what operations were you performing. You can use those as names for your streams. You can say that certain testers using this tool, you can put them against the, the product and understand what's going on. Pretty straightforward. Uh, I wish it had been more straightforward. I could have shown you some dependency check failures and things like that, but uh, for some reason it doesn't like me today. I'll have you know, I've demonstrated this to myself 15 times, and it's never failed. So now that we've seen the demo, um, we're going to move to find out, uh, give you information about where to get these. Um, I think this slide deck will be placed uh, up where OWASP puts all of their slide decks for the show. Um, I know I've already transferred it in so that not only will you have this slide deck, you'll also have some of the comments I made. Uh, I didn't follow exactly the script, but I hope that was, didn't bother anyone. And finally, um, where can you find me? Uh, I'm down at booth 10 in the vendor area, uh, down near the pool. I'd be happy to see anybody come by. It'd be great to talk to you and see what kind of things you're doing. Uh, we can talk about CodeDX, uh, or if you want to simply email me any questions you might have, I'll be more than happy to answer. Any questions? If anyone has questions, I can bring the mic over to them. All right, no questions? Great, thank you very yeah. much for attending. Please.